Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, yes, so my name is uh, Thomas Sturgis. I'm a researcher at the University of Warsaw in Poland uh, in the group of Magdalena Stobinska. The title of my talk is Topological Polaritons and the Bulk Edge Correspondence. I'm going to be talking about a chain of metallic nanoparticles embedded inside a photonic cavity and looking at how we can tailor the properties, uh, the optical properties, and see some topological transitions in this system uh, by modulating, by changing the light matter coupling strength. So how do I, oh, let me try and change screen, I can't, oh, there we go. Okay, so the main message of my talk is that uh, non-trivial, even topological changes to the optical properties of metamaterials can be realized simply by changing the light matter coupling strength. Uh, for example, by changing the height of an, an enclosing photonic cavity. So normally when we think about um, inducing a topological transition, we change the, the parameters of the, of the lattice, we change some symmetry of the lattice to get some different topological uh, regime. Um, but also it's actually possible just to induce topological transitions simply by changing the light matter coupling strength. Uh, more specifically, this talk is going to discuss a one-dimensional chain of metallic nanoparticles uh, embedded inside a photonic cavity. This uh, chain is dimerized, so there's an alternating spacing, d1, d2, d1, d2, etc. Or in other words, the, um, the interaction is, um, alternates from, from site to site. Um, so this talk will be in two parts. The first part will be without the light matter coupling. And in this case, the system very much is analogous to the sushrifa higa model. So it's not, not much more than the SSH model, but just from the perspective of um, plasmonic chain. Then things get uh, interesting when we introduce strong light matter coupling. Um, so for the case with no light matter coupling, there are plasmonic edge states, there are exponentially lo localized edge states. And, um, and these are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with a topological index that you can calculate in the bulk, which I'm sure people are familiar with from the SSH model. Uh, then this bulk edge correspondence, this famous bulk edge correspondence, we show that uh, it breaks down in the regime of strong light matter coupling. So, okay, let me jump into it. So here, here's the model. Um, first of all, like I said, I'm not gonna be talking about light matter coupling at this stage. So we have the chain of metallic nanoparticles uh, in the unit cell, there are two nanoparticles, which we label A and B. Uh, each uh, metallic nanoparticle we model as uh, an oscillating dipole. So the collective charge oscillation, we just model as an oscillating dipole. And uh, then the dipole-dipole interactions in the system give rise to collective plasmonic modes that exist across the whole chain. And uh, in the bulk of this system, these collective plasmonic modes are described by this block Hamiltonian that you can see here, which is uh, very much in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the, the standard SSH model. Uh, there's a, a simple um, on-diagonal constant energy shift, omega naught, which is the resonant frequency of these oscillating dipoles. Capital omega describes the quasi-static Coulomb dipole-dipole interaction strength. And G encodes the um, geometry of the lattice. So we see here the spacings d1, uh, d2, and uh, in this phase factor we see d, which is the length of the unit cell. Um, and I should mention that this block Hamiltonian is in the basis of uh, creation and annihilation operators that create and annihilate uh, collective plasmonic modes with a wave vector q on the a and the b sub lattice uh, respectively. So this uh, block Hamiltonian can be represented in the basis of Pauli uh, matrices. So sigma here is a vector of Pauli matrices and V is uh, a vector that parameterizes this Hamiltonian here. Okay, let's see some results um, which are familiar to you if you know the SSH model. Um, the easiest way to talk about this um, system is to characterize it by its dimerization. So is D1 or is D2 bigger? So epsilon tells us which, which, um, which one is bigger, whether it's um, th this length or this length. So we have three regimes, um, when epsilon is less than zero, when epsilon is greater than zero, and at the transition when there is no dimerization at all. So let's look at how the system looks like. First of all, look at the eigenvalues of the finite chain. There's this band gap here for both um, 
epsilon less and epsilon greater than zero. But for epsilon greater than zero, there's the additional two uh, eigenvalues at um, zero energy. Um, and if we look at the eigenvectors of these eigenvalues, we have uh, exponentially localized edge states. Okay, then moving to the bound structure of the continuum, we see that the, um, the bound structure is identical for both dimerizations. We, we don't see the difference between the dimerizations. To see the difference, we need to look at the eigenvectors in the bulk. So if we plot this vector V, which parameterizes the Hamiltonian in uh, the space of V, the difference between the two dimerizations is that in uh, one case, when you trace out the curve of V in its space, uh, as you move through the Brillouin zone, it does not uh, wind around the origin, whereas in the other dimer dimerization, it does wind around the origin. Okay, so this is the crux, uh, as a very quick summary of the bulk edge correspondence. So there's this uh, winding number, which is, does this loop wind around the origin or not? And uh, in this case, it does. So we, it has a winding, it winds around once. And in the um, trivial case, it doesn't wind around. And so we see that the winding number, the presence of edge states and the band gap all disappear or appear in unison. And to, to go deeper into this, you can also look at um, classes of uh, disorder and perturbation to this um, system and show that under certain classes, the winding number is uh, not changed. And so then you conclude that these edge states are topologically protected. So these are just results that we've reproduced from the context of this plasmonic chain, but it's not really anything more than the, the SSH model. So it's, it's sort of a, an introduction as well. Uh, okay, so moving forward, I, can't, I haven't got time to talk about that in this short talk, but we did um, upgrade this model for more realistic, uh, a more realistic model and asked ourselves, does the bulk edge correspondence hold? So what we have done is we included the effects of the interaction between all neighbors because this is a Coulomb interaction. Uh, this also breaks chirality. Then uh, we also included the non-resonant terms because the dipole-dipole interaction introduces non-resonant terms. So in other words, uh, we have a dagger, a dagger type terms and we do not use the rotating wave approximation. We also investigated the effect of uh, coupling to a photonic, um, the, the free photon environment, so radiative damping and the effects of disorder. And in all cases, the bulk edge correspondence holds. So the next question was, um, what does this system look like in the strong light matter coupling regime? And so now we're getting onto something a little bit more new. Okay, so now let's introduce the effect of uh, strong light matter coupling. So we place our um, plasmonic chain, our chain of metallic nanoparticles inside a photonic cavity. And I should say at this point, that I'm talking from the perspective of metallic nanoparticles, but this could really model any system where the dominant um, interactions uh, are, are dipo dipolar. You can describe your system with uh, oscillating dipoles, then this will work. So for example, it could also be helical uh, microresonators among other, many other systems. But let's keep the focus on metallic nanoparticles for uh, clarity. Okay, so now that we've got this additional phot photonic mode, the Hamiltonian looks like this. So we have our original uh, dipolar Hamiltonian, our plasmonic Hamiltonian that describes the uh, collective plasmonic modes. And in addition, now we have a photonic mode. And this photonic mode uh, interacts with the collective plasmonic modes with a strength of xi and with this phase um, chi. So we can change the light matter interaction strength by changing the um, size of the photonic cavity and uh, modulate the polarotonic modes in that way. So on the left here, we see the dispersion with no light matter coupling. So xi is zero here. And we see again, this blue and this green line are the um, collective plasmonic band structure, which just looks like the uh, SSH model. And then we have these parabol sorry, parabolic uh, photonic modes in red here. Okay, before I give the results, let me just uh, one final slide, because um, for the sake of graphical representation, it's nice to represent this Hamiltonian uh, in a, a two by two um, matrix, because then we can uh, graphically see the winding vector, which is nice, but we don't strictly have to do this. We have calculated the exact, exact phase or winding number in, in different ways, but this is quite a nice graphical representation. So all we've done here is we've taken this um, SU3 free band Hamiltonian, we've solved for the photonic component, substituted it back in, and then we get an SU2 free band Hamiltonian so the complication is that the Hamiltonian depends on the polarotonic eigenvalues themselves, but it means we can write it in the uh, 
bases of Pauli matrices and we have a nice graphical representation of the winding number. <laughs> okay. So the results. First of all, okay, so from left to right, this is uh, increasing light matter interaction strength uh, or increasing cavity height. So the increasing cavity height moves the, the photonic band down towards the plasmonic bands and we get an, an increasing light matter interaction strength. So let's focus on the dispersion first. Uh, remember, this is what the uncoupled dispersion looked like with the plasmonic bands and the parabolic uh, photonic bands. Um, when we then turn on the light matter coupling, there is uh, hybridization between the photon and the collective plasmons, and we see the typical uh, anti-crossing, the Rabi splitting, and we see the effect of this parabolic band is to, you know, punch this um, sort of parabolic feature into this uh, upper plasmonic band, and uh, it, it dips down towards the lower plasmonic band, although of course they're, they're all polaritons uh, at this point. So that's the feature we see of the dispersion. And we also see that at a critical coupling strength, the upper band dips down far enough that we close the, the band gap here. Okay, now moving our attention to the, the winding curve. Uh, again, so remember we can represent the Hamiltonian in the basis of the Pauli matrices, and we have this uh, vector here. And then if we plot this vector as we move along the Brillouin zone, we trace out the curve. And uh, we have parameters here such that we're in a non-trivial phase and the system has edge states without any light matter coupling. But then as we turn on the light matter coupling, it also affects this, this winding curve and it uh, deforms this right side here and it um, moves it and deforms it in such a way that eventually it ends up avoiding the origin. And so although it looks quite complicated, what you can see if you trace your finger uh, around this curve is that you will not uh, wind or you will not encircle the origin and so the winding number changes from uh, non-trivial to trivial, it changes from winding once to not winding uh, at all. Okay and then the final row of results we see is the uh, probability density of the uh, zero energy eigenstate. So um, before light matter coupling we have exponentially localized um, edge states. And then at a critical cavity height, we lose these edge states and they become uh, extended bulk um, states and, and we lose the edge states. So, so this is basically the key result that I'm presenting in this talk today. And if we look, thank you, uh, we have a loss of edge states at this critical uh, cavity height here. These edge states are lost here. Then the band gap closes at this critical cavity height, which we see from the dispersion. And then the winding number changes, which we see from the winding number curve. And the point is that uh, these do not occur at the same time. And we have broken the bulk edge correspondence due to the strong light matter coupling. And that, uh, in a nutshell, is uh, the result. But just to say the same thing twice in a different way, we can see these results looking at uh, uh, the eigenvalues of the finite chain. So here we have uh, the eigenvalues of the finite chain um, as a function of the cavity height and the color scale shows us the participation ratio. So a small number, uh, the participation ratio is a sum over the dipolar components of the eigenvector of the block Hamiltonian and basically a small number tells you that you have a, uh, a localized state and a large number tells you that you have an extended state. So we see the edge states represented by these, this red here, these small, small uh, participation ratio. And then at a critical cavity height, there's a jump in the participation ratio of these states as they merge into uh, the bulk and disappear. And then at another critical cavity height, we see the gap closing. And then although, of course, we can't tell from the finite chain because this is from continuum calculation, the Zach phase changes here, uh, which curiously also coincides with when the first, the lowest upper band re-emerges below the lower bands. But um, anyway, that's not so important. The point again is that the loss of edge states and uh, band gap no longer are synchronized with um, the winding number. Um, I won't talk about it because I don't have enough time, but there may, may be something interesting to look at. We have these uh, mixed states where at the transition, they do become extended in the bulk, but also a little bit peaked at the, the edges. So there may be something like bound states in the continuum, but let, let's not get into that 
right now. Let me just um, wrap up and summarize. So uh, what we've seen is uh, a topological transition simply by changing the height of a photonic cavity without changing the lattice or the properties of the matter system at all. And uh, a breakdown of the bulk edge correspondence due to strong light matter coupling. Um, so I just show this slide here, which shows my um, collaborators in this work. And if you're interested in uh, reading the manuscript, uh, you can find it online uh, with this title, Topological Phases of Polaritons in a Cavity Waveguide. And uh, yeah, I thank you for your attention and I'll take some questions, thanks. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for the great talk. So the, is there already one question by Guillaume? Guillaume, please. Yeah, sorry. Uh, could you go back two slides ago uh, on the slide where again, yes, here, no, no, next one. Uh, so, well, here, uh, well, I'm not sure to understand very well. So, so on the figure on the right, figure E, so mm -hmm. you have this blue line and this green line, mm -hmm. and it's not clear why, uh, well, around the crossing, why blue is blue and why green is green, for instance. Are they crossing the lines or what? And, and, and the rest of the question, it is that it is difficult when, when bands are crossing to compute these uh, invariants. What do you compute exactly? Uh, and uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, I, th I think if I remember correctly, there's, it does, it, it maybe, maybe the blue line should continue because you, hmm, let me think about this. I think, I think you have, well, no, I, th I think there, there is a, like a very, very small anti-crossing here. Um, so that you have, you have like a brighter and a darker mode because you have, um, you have two modes, which are this, or the in-phase and out-of-phase modes. Uh, and so the in-phase in mode is uh, bright and strongly couples to light and the outer-phase mode is dark and weakly couples to light. And so the, the lower band is, is the darker mode. So you don't really see it affected at all uh, until th this point here where there is a very, very small anti-crossing between this upper and lower band. So I think that's what's um, going on there. Um, because it's really a crucial point, yes. Uh, to, when you compute to be sure that uh, you are uh, along the, okay. What, what, okay, you are counting and uh, integrating your, your, your phase, but uh, where to mm -hmm. integrate when it is crossing, it's, it's a key point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is probably, which can change completely the result, in fact. Yeah, I mean, we, we've also tested this for in, when, you, when you introduce um, like all the non-resonant terms and you just, you calculate it instead of just, you know, we don't, we don't just trace out the winding curve, we calculate the Zach phase um, from the, the non-resonant Hamiltonian, which then sort of upgrades it to like a six by six uh, and calculate the Zach phase in this way. And uh, it seems robust. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Other questions? So I have myself a curiosity. So you chose to work with a model where each unit cell contains two matter oscillators and one photonic mode. So uh, this looks a bit strange because you are say, using two different lattice configurations for light and for matter. So how, why did you make this choice? So, well, in, in, the, in the continuum results, you just have one photonic mode, which globally couples to all of the nanoparticle sites. So uh -huh. it's like a, a global coupling. Uh, and then in, and it's basically the sort of same situation for the, for the finite chain. You just have a sequence of, um, when, when, because when you have the finite chain, you then you have the cavity in a box and the photonic modes are um, quantized. And then you just include all of those different quantized uh, modes. Yeah, um, yeah. In the sense that we're using this choice, uh, if you look at the light matter interaction, Basically, the interaction between the two sides to the common mode is uh, uh, is a sort of constant. Is say is the same. Yeah. Always. So if you instead had the mode, the photonic mode, with some spatial structure 
mm. which is flexible enough to couple in a different way to the different uh, nanoparticles in each unit cell, I think mm. that you would have one more degree of freedom and perhaps some different results. Yeah, yeah. Why, I mean, yeah. Why not? So, so maybe including, um, yeah. A, uh, but my feeling is that the physics should leave this uh, flexibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you could you could have a, a photonic um, mo modulation of the photonic component to, to introduce different couplings across the chain. And yeah, I'm sure that would be interesting. So, uh, but in the sense, if, uh, if your model was to be applied to existing systems of SSH in strong coupling, like the ones by Alberto, Jacqueline and their group, I think then uh, the physics would be a bit different. I think it's a bit different when you get into sort of exciton polaritons because they're the polaritons, the exciton polaritons, well, they're already sort of strongly light matter coupled. Um, whereas here you have a chain of these sort of SSH results that's, that's just in the dipolar. And then the, the light matter coupling is sort of this global thing that couples to the, the, the collective modes. Whereas in the exciton polaritons, um, the, this coupling can also come from the photonic component. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a different story. Okay, in somewhat, but I'm sure there are some interesting things, analogues between the two. Good, so thanks, Thomas. Other questions? So if not, I think we have uh, completed our uh, session. We can thank Thomas and all other speakers of the session. And I can leave